Now on the day called Pentecost, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Divided tongues like fire appeared among them, and a tongue came to rest on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them that ability. Now there were living in Jerusalem at that time devout Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, they all came rushing together. They were amazed and saying among themselves, aren't these people who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that we're hearing them in our own language? Look, we're Parthians, Medes, Elamites. We live in Mesopotamia, some of us, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, uh, Phrygia, Pamphylia, uh, Egypt, and those places in Libya that belong to Cyrene. There are visitors from Rome here, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, uh, Arabians, all of us are hearing in our own language of the mighty acts of God. <laughs> they said among themselves, what does this mean? But there were those who sneered and said, it means that they're drunk. Oh, Peter, Peter, when he heard this, he was standing there with the eleven, he stood and said, hey, listen, people, people of Judea and all of those of you, in Jerusalem, listen to what I have to say. These people are not drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is as the prophet Joel said it would be. In those days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old ones will dream dreams and your young ones will see visions. Even upon those who are enslaved, I will pour out my spirit, both men and women, and they will prophesy. I will show you signs in heaven and also on the earth, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun will turn into darkness and the moon into blood on that day, that day before the Lord comes. Oh, that glorious day. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's the story of the Spirit coming to the church at Pentecost. People of God have always recorded stories about how they lived out their faith in the unique times and circumstances in which they found themselves. We too are living in unique times. Scripture reminds us that faith forms the foundation for a life worth living in any and every circumstance. It tells us that acts of faith are what distinguished our ancestors setting them above the crowd. Noah, Abraham, Sarah, and Moses. By faith, each of these ancestors did things that were not humanly possible. And God's plan was that their faith and our faith would come together to make the faith complete. So we ask ourselves, who are the saints whose lives have inspired and influenced us 
How do their stories help complete our own stories? And if we were to open a time capsule from their time on earth, what might we find? Because scripture also tells us this, all these leaders, all those who blaze the way and cheer us on, it means we'd better get on with it, start running and never quit. So let's ask ourselves, how are we being called to live out our history with faith? Where in this time and space do we find evidence of our living God? What will we put in our own time capsule? The journey may not be our choosing, but we believe God is with us. Most of us know the story about Noah and the ark. God was not super happy with the way that humanity was conducting themselves on earth, so God decided to try a do-over, so to speak, and sent a flood to cover all of the earth. God did, however, like the looks of Noah and his family, and so God told Noah, and if you've ever been to church camp, you know this to be true, to build an arky arky because there was going to be a floody floody. And the floods come, and the waters recede, and Noah and his family get out of the ark, and God makes a covenant with them and tells them that they should be fruitful and multiply and repopulate the earth. And boy, did they get down to business. The 10th chapter of Genesis is basically just a list of the multiplying generations. So all of these people spoke the same language and used the same words, which made it easy for them to decide that what they really needed was a big, amazing, grand city where they could all live together and never have to worry about being scattered across the earth. They decided that it should have a tall tower that stretched all the way to heaven. The thing was, nobody bothered to run the building plans past God, who was not at all happy when God found out about the people's plans. So the story goes, God decided to mix it up a bit. God made it so that the people didn't understand one another. They stopped building the great city, and they scattered themselves all over the earth. So now, scattered all over the place and unable to understand one another's languages, it became pretty unlikely that the people would ever be able to work together again. The Bible never says exactly what went wrong with Babel or why God was so upset about the people's building project. Maybe God was concerned that the people were closing themselves off from the rest of the world or that they chose to huddle together in a fortified city rather than multiply over the earth the way that God had asked them to. Jewish Midrash, which is a way of interpreting the stories in answer to the questions that the scriptures draw out, provides several stories about what happened in Babel. In one story, the Tower of Babel grew and grew until it took a whole year to pass the bricks from the top, bottom to the top, one person to the other. So the bricks became so precious to the project that when a brick fell and broke, the people wept. But when a human being fell and died, No one paid any attention. The bricks became more important to them than each other. Maybe that was it, that the desire for domination started to take over their lives and cloud their ability to see even the people around them. Douglas Donnelly, the pastor of University Baptist Church in Minneapolis, writes that Babel remains a very real part of how we understand life. We live in Babel, he says. We work in Babel. We breathe Babel. We are the children of Babel. Donnelly says, Babel is what makes injustice thrive. Babel is what makes the distinction between rich and poor. Babel is what makes people think they can own other people. Babel is what makes people think they can condemn other people. 
Babel is what makes enemies. Vivian Paley is a kindergarten teacher, the author of several books on education, and a MacArthur Genius Grant recipient. And some years ago, she got the idea for an experiment when she noticed how often the children in her classroom told each other no. No, there's no room for you to play with us. No, I promise to play with the next game with someone else. No, we're already playing. You can't join in. And she noticed it was always the same children who were being told no. Haley says that by kindergarten, those divisions are forming among the children, kids that who are acceptable and kids who are unacceptable, kids who are included in the play and the ones who are always told no, the ones who are valuable and the ones who are disposable. We're building Babel, even as kindergartners, the walls that we build up, the gates around our communities, the polarization, the disputes where we put ourselves on one side and define others as being with us or against us. That's Babel. Babel is when we seek unity by casting others out. Babel is saying, no, you can't play. Vivian Paley proposed to her students a new rule for their classroom. She wrote it up on the front board of the room. The rule was, you can't say you can't play, which essentially means if someone wants to join your game, you have to let them. Mrs. Paley's new rule was met with a great amount of, in her words, amazement and distrust and fear. The children were worried that they would not be able to handle this new rule. They were worried that their fun would be spoiled if they had to include anyone who wanted to join. One student, a girl named Lisa, was particularly vocal about her dissatisfaction with the new rule. On the first day that the rule went into effect, she said, it's not fair at all. I just want my own friends. There's some people I just don't like. Even so, Mrs. Paley said that once the rule was put into place within a week, it was as if it had always been that way. And, Mrs. Paley says, this rule was rather a, a rather significant changing event in Lisa's life. She says that for years after she left kindergarten, whenever Lisa would see her in the hallway, she would stop Mrs. Paley and ask her how the rule was going. And she would give an example of something she had done to show Mrs. Paley that she was still trying to follow the rule. Mrs. Paley says, the last time I met her was in the grocery store with her mother. And she said, Mrs. Paley, it's still really pretty hard for me, but I know I can do it and I always try. And her mother nodded and said, she really does, you know. On the day of Pentecost, all of the disciples were gathered together in a room in a town that was filled with people from all over the earth who had come to Jerusalem for the festival of the weeks, a celebration of the day when God revealed the Torah on Mount Sinai. The town was filled with people who spoke different languages and came from different cultures and lived different lives. On the day of Pentecost, when they were all gathered together in one place, a place that was surrounded by every kind of person from every kind of place you could possibly imagine, there was a rush of wind that filled the entire house where they were sitting, and tongues as a fire rested on each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other languages. They didn't speak in the same language. They began to speak in other languages. And the people who heard them were amazed and astonished. And they said, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. See, Pentecost is the reversal of the Tower of Babel. Pentecost is the tearing down of the walls we've built to separate us. Pentecost is God saying to us, 
you can't say you can't play. In this dramatic, crazy, unexpected, chaotic, wonderful moment, God reaches out to us and affirms that in spite of all our apparent differences, we are all God's beloved children. Vivian Paley writes that once she put the rule into effect, there was a palpable sense of relief in her class, as if they'd been rescued from meanness. Pentecost reminds us that through his death and resurrection, Christ rescues us from the death-dealing ways of meanness and divisiveness and exclusion. Pentecost declares that by the power of the Spirit, we are free to be a different kind of community. Right after Pentecost, the early church changed the way they did things. They got rid of their class distinctions, which had separated them from one another, and they held all of their money together, and they gave it out as people needed it. The Spirit moved among them, and they saw the world in a different way, and they saw each other in a new way, not as people to be suspicious of, but as people to learn from, people to care for, people to share life with, fellow children of God. It didn't last forever, though. Babel started to creep in again. Not too much later in Acts, the early church began to fight with one another about whether or not new converts should be circumcised and follow the Jewish law. When Paul starts talking about the different gifts that God gives to all of us, the church started arguing over which gift of the Spirit was the best one. We are children of Babel. That is certainly true. But we are children of Pentecost also. We have received the Holy Spirit and the promise of unity that the Spirit brings, amazing, bewildering, frightening though it can be. We have been given the power of the Spirit to break through our walls and reach out to those who have been scattered to the far reaches. That's the new rule that Pentecost brings. Sometimes it's still pretty hard for us, but we can do it. So let's always try. Amen. In the midst of new dimensions, in the face of changing ways, who will lead the pilgrim peoples wandering in their separate ways? God of rainbow, fiery pillar, leading where the eagles soar. We are people, ours the journey, now and ever. a gift in your creation, each a love song to be sung.
threats of dire predictions cause us to withdraw in pain. May your blazing phoenix spirit resurrect the church again. God of rainbow, fiery pillar, leading where the eagles soar. We are people, ours the journey, now and ever, now and ever, now and ever more. All right, it is that time for us to share our tithes and our offerings. And uh, if you've got something that you can send to your church, either through check or online, um, every dollar is supporting the good work our churches continue to do in this season. And uh, if this isn't a week that you can send something in monetarily, we know that we all have things to offer to God. And so take this time to pray and think and um, hear what God is calling you to offer. Let us share now our morning tithes and offerings. We'd love, like to give to Shiloh United Methodist Church. Go to shilohbillings.church forward slash give. Text an amount to 406-382-3185. Send checks to 1810 Shiloh Road, Billings, Montana, 59106. We'd like to give to Hope United Methodist Church. Go to hopeumcbillings.org and click donation. Send checks to Hope United Methodist Church, P.O. Box 50066. Billings, Montana, 59105-0066. We'd like to give to Grace United Methodist Church. Go to graceumcbillings.org forward slash give. Text an amount to 406-660-3699 or send checks to 1935 Avenue B, Billings, Montana, 59102. If you'd like to give to Evangelical United Methodist Church, we invite you to go online at actyourfaith.breezechms.com forward slash give forward slash online. Text an amount to 406-306-1231 or send checks to 345 Broadwater Avenue, Billings, Montana, 59101. If you'd like to give to First United Methodist Church, go to billingsfirst.breezechms.com forward slash give forward slash online. Text an amount to 406-412-2402 or send checks to 2800 4th Avenue North, Billings, Montana, 59101. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Now is the time in our service where we come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray together as the church this Pentecost Sunday. God of wind and flame, blow into our lives this morning with your spirit. Ignite a fire in each of us, a fire of hope and possibility for things ahead. Transform in us to become a people who share your love with this weary world. A people who proclaim your hope and your good news. Baptizing God, you have marked us and chosen us and claimed us in the waters of baptism. As your chosen people, your royal priesthood, your beloved church, 
we ask this Pentecost Sunday that you would wash us clean from the stains of shame and sad sadness that cling to our souls. Give us new birth and new life through the power of your resurrection, Jesus. God of all people, you meet us in our joys and thanksgiving. We ask that you would enter into celebration with us for all of the new life that is in this world through babies and graduations, new jobs and new opportunities. We thank you for your healing, for your reconciliation, and for your provision, Lord. Now we lift up our joys and praises silently to you now. God of hope, you meet us in our pain, fear, and despair. You hear our cries of horror when we feel like prejudice and injustice are at every turn. We ask for mercy and justice for the children of God whose lives were taken from them due to violent acts of racism in our country. For George Floyd, for Ahmaud Arbery, for Breonna Taylor, for Eric Garner, for Philando Castile, for Trayvon Martin, for all of our siblings of color, children of God who are suffering at the hands of senseless violence and injustice. Lord, hear our prayer. God of healing, we ask that you would bring comfort to those who find themselves anxiously awaiting doctor's phone calls, anxiously awaiting to leave hospital rooms, anxiously awaiting surgery appointments. Bring peace to those who mourn the loss of a loved one this morning or miss the presence physically of a friend. We ask that you would give traveling mercies for those who are going to be going to places temporarily this summer or permanently with new moves. We thank you for Pastor Mike and for T and their time with us in Billings this year. We ask that you would give them traveling mercies as they make their way to Arizona in a few weeks and that you would be with our new pastor, Pat Lewis and his wife, Kim, as they come to Billings and the family of church First United Methodist Church. We pray for those who worry about where their next meal, their next check for rent, or their next place to sleep will come from. God of Pentecost, you equip us to be the saints we were made to be, to do the work of your church today and to advance the kingdom of God forever. Fill us this morning with your spirit that we might go out continuing to bring love, justice, and inclusion to all your children. We pray this in the name above all names, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespassers, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Sent out in Jesus' name, our hands are ready now to make the earth a place in which the kingdom comes. Sent out in Jesus' name, our hands are ready now to make the earth a place in which the kingdom comes. The angels cannot change a world of hurt and pain into a world of love, of justice and of peace. The task is our Come